This is the Ridge Hunter Outdoors podcast. Clark here with Nate Burgess and as we told you guys last week we got our guest on this week uh, actually our first guest of the podcast so um, it's Steve Shirk we covered an article by him I believe the title was and you can correct me if I get this wrong is October the new November I believe that was the one that, that is just right that we covered so uh, we did that back in October we really liked the article uh, we got hooked up with Steve to do get him on the podcast uh, to talk about some stuff for you guys he has a lot of public land experience which he'll go into and some big wood stuff so it'll be something a little different uh, we're not really into that world ourselves so we'll get somebody who's got a lot more experience than we do to talk about that but steve first of all thanks for coming on and then uh how about just a little bit of your background as far as like where you got started hunting and then we can kind of lay out a timeline where you're at now sure yep i mean I uh, I grew up in uh, northern Pennsylvania, and I've actually lived in the same place this whole time. I'm 35 years old. Um, it's here. I mean, I've only ever known what's here. Uh, there's tons of public land. It's all big woods, mountainous terrain. Um, I grew up in a family that uh, uh, you know was had a huge tradition of especially deer hunting. Uh, mainly, you know, our own particular camp. So, mm -hmm. uh, just looking up to a lot of the the people in my family and friends that, you know, and the camp life was a big uh, kind of a draw that you know set me off at a at a young age. So, um, ever since honestly before I was even old enough to hunt, you know, my dad had me in the woods when I was like literally four or five years old, and yeah. I think I was tagging along deer hunting with him by like eight. So it's just something I really think it's just been in my blood. And uh, so I, even though, you know, I've been doing it for quite a while now, I swear every year my passion, you know, grows more and more. Mm -hmm. So um, it's led me into, uh, you know, I'm an outfitter. Uh, I also, you know, do a lot of writing. Uh, you know, one one place in particular I know you brought up uh, for North American mm -hmm. Whitetail Magazine, I'm a contributor there. So uh, it's just uh, it's just been really cool to be passionate about something and uh, to just kind of follow that passion and it, just to see where it has led me in life is has you know I've been pretty fortunate and uh, uh, definitely God has blessed me in a lot of ways through it. So, but I appreciate you guys having me and uh, can't wait to get started. Yeah, absolutely. So um, before we jump into the other stuff, here a couple episodes ago. Um, we kind of just had an end of the season campfire and we told some stories and stuff. So I think we probably all told our story of our first deer or first buck. Um, everybody remembers it. So what's your story on the first deer or first buck, whatever you want to go with? Um, I know you remember it, so you got a good story yeah. there. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think I'll go with my first buck, even though the first deer, it was pretty cool too, but right. something about that first buck to me, like, um, just something that that's, that's kind of unique about me, and this is not to brag at all, but my first year in hunting, I, I shot a deer, just a doe, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, I was 12 years old, but I really wanted to get a buck, and it, like, it set me off, like, so bad that I told myself that when I'm 13, I'm going to shoot a buck, and I'm never going to, I'm going to at least do whatever I can to never go another year without, you know, uh, shooting a buck. Right. And since I've been 13, that has actually happened. But no kidding. The, really, the really cool thing about that first buck, though, was uh, um, it was kind of similar results as the season before. It was getting further into the gun season. I hunted all of archery, you know, no luck. And uh, my uncle, two uncles, actually, just kind of put me into a spot, and they were, you know, kind of, you know, putting the drive on for me. Mm -hmm. And I remember just seeing this three point come by and, uh, I was just like, even though it was a three point, like it, to me, it, it was just like the biggest trophy ever, because that was actually like the first buck I had ever even got, knew I was going to get an opportunity at. Right. And, uh, um, so <laughs> the funny part about it was, so I shot it 
and uh, the deer just ran like 50 yards and went down. Uh-huh. And this is this is hilarious. But I emptied my gun. <laughs> I was using a 257 Roberts. The deer was dead. I think I had six shells in my gun. I shot it five more times <laughs> just to make sure it didn't get off. And I think I hit it every time too. <laughs> but uh, I I was so nervous and concerned that somehow, some way. Right. And that was the first deer I ever shot with a gun, too. So I was inexperienced as mm-hmm. far as what happened. But I was, I was just like, you know what? I am not going to let this thing. I mean, it wasn't even. It looked like a dead log, and I'm <laughs> yeah. still shooting at it. So, it didn't have a chance, huh? <laughs> nope. And uh, there wasn't much meat left on that deer, but I could have cared less. I, right? uh, yeah. I remember, uh, you know, uh, my dad. You know, we got one of them little antler plaques for mm-hmm. it, and you know, mm-hmm. I still have it and. I've shot a lot better deer since then, but honestly, that first buck to me was was probably one, maybe my most favorite moment as a deer hunter ever. Yeah, that's awesome. And we, we like hearing that stuff. That's <laughs> yeah. one of the things we all love about hunting, and we like to talk about that stuff when we can, too. So wanted yeah, to get absolutely. something like that before we get into too serious of stuff here. <laughs> so, uh, sure. But we'll jump into that now. So like you said, you're, you're outfitting out there. Um, yep. How did you get into that? And then uh, mm-hmm. where are you at now with it? I mean, obviously, you guys do pretty yeah. good. We follow you on Instagram and stuff, and it looked like you guys had a pretty good season. Yeah, we did. We had a pretty good year. Um, the outfitting thing was something I never even thought would happen. Um, uh, but I I think, I, you know, obviously you know that, you know, I do some outdoor writing. So I was actually doing some part-time writing for a magazine in Pennsylvania, it was called Northwestern Pennsylvania Outdoors. It's actually out of business now. Mm-hmm. But they had me write an article about grouse hunting, and, and I was never really much of a grouse hunter. But I knew a lot about grouse because grouse, are, they, they're similar with deer as far as, you know, how they relate in habitat, like clear cuts and those kind of things. So I was always, like, finding tons of grouse. And the, the, at that time, the grouse population in my area was was as good, if not the best, in the country. I kid you not. Really? So I wrote an article about just not so much grouse hunting, but like the grouse numbers and the habitat in that right. part of Pennsylvania. And uh, uh, next thing you know, I'm getting all these people from all over the country asking me to take them grouse hunting. <laughs> Here they think, you know, I'm some big grouse hunter. <laughs> So I kind of, I, I kind of went along with it. Right. You know, I, I didn't really tell them, you know, I'm a grouse guide or, uh-huh. but basically I was like telling these people, yeah, just come and I'll, I'll get you on grouse, which I knew I could. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so totally I uh, started, yeah, I started taking people grouse hunting and it went really well. But the thing about it was, is like, I mean, yeah, it was great being in the woods and, you know, guiding people, but I just, I'm not a passionate grouse hunter and you mm-hmm. see like, there's very serious, obviously, like bird hunters oh, out yeah. there. Like some people take bird hunting just as serious as any other kind of hunting. Mm-hmm. And I just wasn't like fitting in with it. Um, like it was, you know, once again, it was nice to be in the woods guiding, but I'm like, you know what? I really like this guiding thing, mm-hmm. but I want to guide something that I'm really passionate about. Yeah. So, so I ended up switching to the deer hunting after probably. I don't know, four or five years, and I've been doing it about 10 years now. Um, and it was pretty slow at first because when you first start out, especially I come from a state that's not known for good deer, so mm-hmm. that was hard to get people to come here. And also uh, just no reputation really as right. well. Yeah. So my first few years, you know, you're just doing whatever you can to get people to come. It didn't matter experience or Mm -hmm. really price or anything. I was just almost begging. I actually at times would take people for free just to get something going. But uh, after a while, you know, people, uh, you know, started to have have some good hunts. We had some success and started to get some return clients. And then now, you know, close to, like I said, about 10 years later, we probably get it. Usually about a seventy to eighty percent return on our clients every year, so cool. uh, it's it's turned into another uh, just a blessing from God for me. Right, um, and you're doing all that, like you said, pretty much everything you or everything you do is on public land. So you're guiding on public land out there, similar to what I mean, somewhat similar to what you'd see out west with the elk guides exactly. and stuff on public ground. Okay, just for yep, white tails, a- obviously. Yep, there's several several hundred thousand acres here. It's a really big area. Wow. I mean, the mountains may not be as big as the Rockies, but it's right. 
far as area goes, I mean, I'm not saying it's the same, but it's definitely a adventurous mm -hmm. experience, you know, a lot of wilderness, remote country. So uh, people, uh, I think um, it's, a, it's a unique thing, too. Like, it's just something different, and a lot of people are like, you know what, I want to just give that a try. And right. Just because it's, it's not the typical hunt that you see in a lot of, especially this, the eastern part of the mm -hmm. country, there, there's not a lot of this type of, you know, these type right. of hunts that you can buy. Yep. Yep. Um, so with that, uh, we're out of the season now. Um, I assume your guys' yep. season's wrapped up as well um, on the whitetail yep. side. So what are you doing as not even necessarily an outfitter, but just as a public land hunter? Um, yep. Like as private ground guys right now, we're starting the planning process for next year. of What can we improve on our property? Um, looking sure. at all the data we've got from this year, from last year, trying to figure the deer out a little better that we have on our property. And then what we can actually go in and do as far as whether it be food plots, trails, bedding areas, stuff yep. like that. Uh, obviously you're not doing that kind of stuff on public ground necessarily. Um, what are you guys mm -hmm. doing this time of year? Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's similar, except the thing about me is like, I have no control over like, of creating habitat, mm -hmm. food plots, you know, but, but it, like I can still, you know, there's, there's areas in particular deer that I want to get to know better. This is a great time of year to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, even though, you know, I would, to me, I feel I had a successful season, but I still am one of those kind of guys that. I'm always looking back, like, what could I have done better? Yeah. Um, so going into certain areas and just trying to see, you know what, I think I failed in this area or I need to improve here and there. So it's a good time of year to really just improve as a hunter. Um, I don't care how much experience you have or, or what. You There's never a – you can't just uh, reach at a, a ultimate level in deer hunting. There's no climax. It's uh, – there's – there's just so much to deer hunting that that is yet to be discovered, mm -hmm. in, in my opinion. So I'm just constantly reaching to, and it's not so much about even getting better. It's just I have the desire to learn more, and and it's just I just soak it up like, like uh, you know, like a wet sponge. Yeah. I, I never can get enough of it. Yeah, and uh, we talk about it all the time. There's not necessarily any absolutes, and and. You know, a lot yep. of things do stay the same, but a lot of things change from year to year, too, so it's good to get in there and, and learn that stuff, and obviously that, that's the same on the public ground side, too. So, um, Absolutely. As, as far as that goes, what kind of stuff are you looking for when you're out there, uh, if you're doing scouting this time of year on that public ground? Um, what are some yep. things that you might come across that pique your interest or some stuff you're doing? Uh, are you guys doing a lot of shed hunting out there in the next, you know, month or so? Um, what's yep. that look like? Yep, I just kind of started this week. It's been a little bit tricky this year, uh, you know, me moving into a new house and that this time of year. But I did, I have found two sheds this week. It's pretty tough, though, out here right now. There's like 15 to 20 inches of snow. Yeah. So yeah. that makes it really challenging. Right. Um, but, you know, it's it's one of those things like, you know, there's some people that would say, well, I'm not going to go out there, you know, and look for sheds. But if i if i don't find a shed too like i could care less i maybe i find some good sign or once again i can i can i can shed hunt but still go out there and always take something from the woods uh to make me a better hunter and and just you know, even just a better person in general um so as much as i want to say that you know i'm shed hunting it's it kind of turns into a mix of things this time of year uh you know, another thing that's tricky about being like a public land big woods hunter is things are actually constantly changing. Like you got areas that are getting logged. Mm -hmm. um, you you have uh, you know different types of like some years you have food sources in this area or mass crops, and mm -hmm. you know I'll just go through areas like you know I don't really know if there's oaks in here or not. You know I want to I want to find where you know where the oaks are rather than you know, once the season comes, go around tromping through areas, searching, yeah. to, you know, to find all those things and specific bedding cover. Like now is the time I'm just kind of doing all of that. And I'm really, I am, I'm, none of that is going to impact next year whatsoever. So, right. you know, it's just a whole lot of things at once. I mean, obviously shed hunting right now is, is really starting to, you know, set its peak, at, you know, as far as my interest goes. But, uh, I'm just, overall just kind of 
doing a whole bunch of things at once, just just like just similar to what you guys are doing. Right. Yep. Uh, pretty much the extent of my knowledge on the public ground stuff comes from the hunting public. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with them if you're doing yeah. public ground hunting. A lot of stuff they'll talk about. You know, they're they're looking for the transition lines, uh, obviously potential bedding areas, and then like you said, mass crops. Um, yep. With being in the big woods, do you see a lot of that stuff? Um, oh yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, yeah, definitely. Like uh, a lot of our buck bedding is still in thicker cover. Uh, mm-hmm. Clear cuts are really really good. Um, we also have you know different types of just brush, whether it's red brush, beech brush. But that's that's the real key. Like some of these things, you can't you can't do it online or from satellites. You have to put boots on the ground. Right. Um, and that's you know I'll just go through areas that uh, almost just like blind and just like you know just almost grid searching mm-hmm. as far as uh, just trying to find you know whether it's food sources cover. And, it, you, you know, I might go into an area four, five, six days in a row until it's like, okay, wow, well, I got this area figured out. And, you know, sometimes it's even you feel like you didn't find anything. Mm-hmm. Then sometimes, you you know, you hit the jackpot. Right. So, um, and that's what I'm really big on is, I you know, I know satellite imagery and all that is, is inc- an incredible tool. Mm-hmm. But I have found that if you're a boots-on-the-ground guy, um, especially this time of year when you can afford to do that, you're going to find 10 times more when you go into areas mm-hmm. and put the footwork in versus, you know, just kind of gambling, picking spots, you know, just off of a map. So this is the time of year to definitely, you know, go into your areas, learn them very thoroughly, and, uh, you know, it will definitely pay off the next season. Yeah, we we see a lot of that on the consulting side of the house where, We'll sit down, you know, to start with and use all that satellite imagery to kind of come up with a pre-plan. But until you yep. actually get out and walk the property, there's just so much you can't see. Um, yep. And being a public land hunter, like, I try, I get away more and more from the satellite stuff because I know that everyone else is using it. Right. So I'm trying to, to go into areas with a little different mindset and outlook because really everybody's kind of looking at this for the same things mm-hmm. and and really you're just going to find yourself starting out in a lot of the same places as everyone else so yeah. um if i try to you know once again uh, try to find sometimes more harder to get to areas mm-hmm. stuff that gets overlooked uh especially like cover that's um underneath the the, ma- the majority of the tree canopy that right. can't be seen you know on, on satellites like just those little things uh, you have to be a lot more different on public land in a lot of places just because you know once you start um you know hunting side by side with a lot of people yeah trust me that that means you you're in the complete opposite direction of where you're going to kill a good deer <laughs> right yeah yep that was going to be my question for you um how many people are you running into out there um i'm looking on uh uh, satellite image right now i'm looking mm-hmm. it looks like from i-80 all the way to the north edge of the state uh for yep. uh most of the middle and western part uh you said you hunted mountains it looks like you really are serious it looks like you're hunting mountains <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> that, oh uh, yeah definitely uh, yep. that uh, yep. uh we're fairly flat around here we've got some rolling hills uh some creek bottoms and stuff uh we don't have yep. anything like what i'm seeing here uh, so how many people are you running into, and then what are you looking for specifically hunting these whitetails uh, in yep. mountain country? Yep. Um, well, the, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but the hunting pressure from what I see every year has been going down more and more. Yeah. And it's, you know, I don't know if it's the same everywhere else or not, but it's definitely the case here. It, it's it's nice when uh, you have less hunters to deal with and deer less pressure but then you also start to wonder like is this the way it is going everywhere and then if that's the case means our sport is dying so yeah it it works both ways it can it can hurt you and harm you in the long run but um no matter what it's public land and and i'm definitely running into hunters yeah um but you know we talked earlier you know you know about uh you know doing the off-season stuff so i've there's not really a lot of guys or hunters that, that are putting in a ton of time in the off season. Oh, yeah. So I feel that 
doing all that now, I feel like I'm a little bit ahead of the game. Um, and, you know, I can – I already have a better feel. Like, if, if you're doing all your homework right before the season starts, you're probably going to be, you know, five or six steps behind always. Me, I, if, if anything, not to brag, but I feel like I'm usually one or two steps behind – from sealing the deal just because yeah. I'm putting so much work in off the, in the off season. But yeah. as far as what I'm looking for, I mean, once again, I, I'm not a big map guy, uh, but I'm looking for, I'm looking for good cover, um, mainly in the upper third of the mountains. Ah, okay. Um, I, yep. The, the, the most of your mature bucks will bed up high as long as, um, as long as there's not a lot of pressure up there. Like, in some in some areas, you'll have most of your uh, your logging roads and access roads on the upper part of the mountains, and that will actually uh, force deer or bucks to bed lower because they start to realize that that's where the hunting pressure is. Huh. And once again, this is probably more of a public land thing than yeah. maybe somewhere where there is no pressure. But pressure you, is is one of the number one things you always have to keep in mind. Like oh, yeah. I, I swear, a mature buck like his security. I don't care how good a food you have or, or what his security is always going to be his number one thing on his mind. And that can even be for some of them, even in the rut. So finding those safe havens and, and learning how bucks, uh, use the mountains and use areas, uh, to, uh, to, to get away from hunters and how bucks kind of have a sense of, you know, they have a sense of knowing, well, there, nobody's going to go back in this deep or, You'll, yeah. you'll find a lot of that. The further back you go, the it, it almost gets easier as far as uh, the deer are a little bit less pressured, and you tend to find more of them sometimes when you get further away from those roads and those access points. Yeah. Uh, do you have spots uh, that you, uh, like us, we've got our ground, uh, places we got permission, whatever, you know, uh, year after year we know that's where we can hunt. You knowing yep. that you can go anywhere out there that's on public, uh, do you keep going back to the same spots year after year, or is it always moving around for you? It's it's one of those things you just never know. Like yeah. some years you'll have back to back, but once again, you've got like you have no control over the environment when you hunt public land in most places. Yeah. Once again, I talked about logging. This year, uh, this past season, we had what they call it was a gypsy moth hatch like a massive almost like a uh, plague where they uh in, in like uh probably from i would say june through august there wasn't an oak leaf on any tree and in, in our mountains Man. because these gypsy moths they ate all the leaves wow. so then what happened was even though you know some of the acorn production was starting to to bloom in the trees uh, the oaks had to drop the acorns prematurely in order to regenerate their leaf growth. Yeah. So we had no acorns at all. So Man. the year before, a lot of our success was on the oak ridges and, and in the acorns. So all of a sudden, everything you did last year can be thrown into the garbage because you don't have an acorn crop. Yeah. And I can't plant a food plot or, or whatever. There's no baiting allowed in Pennsylvania. So right. you've got to be able to adapt quickly. You... you um you kind of got to keep your options open and be prepared for a lot of different things to happen. Um, and, uh, that's why, you know, I try to, uh, I, I guess I would say that I try to be more of a, like a versatile hunter. And, um, luckily, you know, I'm not one of those guys that just relies on a couple spots. Uh, if I was just hunting Oak Ridges, you know, this year, I probably would have really struggled, but I, you know, I did some things differently. i Felt that I because there is limited food, I focus more around bedding. Um, that's one thing is you know the cover really didn't change, just the food changed. So mm -hmm. uh, I knew that I could focus around bedding areas and find some consistency, and that's really what I did, and you know that still seemed to work. So uh, while we're kind of on the bedding part, we were talking yeah. last week about whether we thought the deer this time of year will deal with what food they have close to good bedding or what yep. bedding they have close to good food. So what are you seeing? Because obviously it gets pretty cold where you're at. You said you got like almost a foot and a half of snow out there. Um, yep. What's your experience? Are you seeing the deer uh, dealing with what bedding they have close to good food 
or are they putting bedding first and then dealing with what food they have there knowing they can travel to it? To me, once again, it all depends on the pressure. If you have, say, like you have like a, a really good bumper acorn crop, mm-hmm. um, you know, on a, on a particular ridge, and uh, but there's a lot of hunting pressure there, yeah. I can guarantee you, you will not see a mature buck feeding in there right. whatsoever. And and a lot of them, I've backtracked them, you know, especially this time of year, what I would do is I'll get like a picture of a buck, you know, within a couple of days on a camera. And what, with snow, you can literally follow him right back to, to where he bedded. And yeah. I kid you not, I've, I've followed him a mile or two from his main food source. Wow. And that's how far some of these deer will go. Right. But I've seen it just the opposite, like, a couple of years ago, uh, when I was guiding um, in some real remote country, the bucks were bedding right in the food. Like they weren't either. You think about it; they're it's kind of like a post rut scenario. They're mm-hmm. they're wore out, but yet they're trying to pack on you know those fat reserves for the winter. It made no sense that those bucks would leave the leave the food source when nobody was ever going back in these areas. Right. Yeah. So they would just eat lay back down, maybe go 20 yards, find some more feed, lay back down. Mm -hmm. So it all, honestly, in the public land, it just, hunting pressure is your number one enemy as a hunter and for the deer themselves. We both, we both have to look at hunting pressure Mm -hmm. as being our, you know, number one, number one thing to deal with. So, uh, I know around here and one of the guys, Jeff, that is on the podcast frequently, he hunts mm-hmm. next to some public ground, and then obviously with the shop we got up here that my old man runs, uh, we get quite a few customers that hunt public ground. It seems mm-hmm. like a lot of the pressure, at least around here, doesn't start on that public ground until almost pre-rut time. So like last couple sure. weeks of October, last week of October. So uh, as far as that goes, uh, yep. is there a certain time of year where you see the pressure really start to kick up and change them, or is it pretty much just opening day, uh, they shift uh, because of the pressure that's coming at them, is is there a kind of a time of year where you see it really start to make a difference, or is it pretty much just um, beginning to end? You know, I mean, it sounds crazy. I'm not going to say deer have a calendar, but <laughs> I swear it just seems like every year there's not even many people like out in the woods. You know, say mid to late September, our archery season always comes in usually around the first Saturday of October, mm-hmm. but you always start to see a shift around these times, and um, I just this is this is my theory. I can't say it's true, but I do think like genetically and just as 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 decades of deer groups go on that it it actually is in their gene code of knowing that this time of year they have to be more you know more picky as far as uh you know they 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 tend to be more nocturnal and even even some of the doe activity changes and it's funny like the, on on my trail cameras you know all summer you can there can even be like a field area you'll get bucks in in daytime all summer in fields um uh, wide open clear cuts you'll see them crossing the roads mm-hmm. and then usually it's about you know the last to the second week or the last week of september and then right through october everything starts getting more and more nocturnal yeah. and it's and i can tell you that it's not I don't see a major increase in people being in the woods, but yet the deer know something's going on. And I know there's some other biological factors as far as, like, I do believe that it's another time period where bucks try to really put on reserves and that for Mm -hmm. the rut. A lot of different things, you know, a lot of testosterone and different things going through their bodies. But I still believe that deer have that sense of, okay, here we go again. It's going to be that time soon. And, we got to lock up, be more protective, and be more nocturnal. And it, it just seems to be that way every year. Yeah. Um, okay, one more question, unless Nate's got something else, then we can let you go because we're getting close on time. Uh, sure. We, like hunting on private ground, will be a lot more risk-averse, I think, as opposed to some guys that I you know, interact with that hunt on the public ground um, where they might take a little bit higher risk because of the situation they're in on the public um, what's kind of your thoughts on that? If you know where a certain buck's at, will you be more aggressive uh, because you're on public ground, or you just kind of try to like? Is it more similar to what we do? Sit and wait till everything's right, and then go in there after him. Uh, what's the- I if 
if it's a deer that I'm really interested in, I'd rather go when I feel it's like, say we got like a major cold front or something coming in. And even if it's like middle of October, like that's kind of the stuff that I'm, that I would, I would rather go in when I'm really confident that that deer is going to move in the daylight versus just pounding on them, hoping for a miracle. Right. Um, but you can also, it depends on, you know, it depends on your options. Like, when you, when you have a ton of land, you know, especially like where I'm at, I'm very fortunate compared to a lot of other, you know, hunters, but I think you can be more aggressive here. I'm not, I think you're going to, you're going to be swinging for the fence, you know, nine out of 10 times at least and, right. and not getting anything. But the reason is, is, you know, there's so much area here and you can hunt a lot of different deer that, so, so what you bump one and ruin it, there's always another one to go after somewhere else. Right. But it's just one of those things, like, for me, like, sometimes we get our hearts really set on a particular deer, mm-hmm. and uh, you don't want to ruin ruin your chance for when you know there's going to be a few days, a few, you know, good October cold fronts or just those perfect time periods where you that's when it's going to be your best chance. So yeah. I, I think if it's a deer that you really, really want and, you know, your heart's set on, then I, that's when I think you got to be more careful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense, and that's kind of where we're at. A lot of times, we'll have it, you know, yep. a certain deer picked out where we don't want to go mess things up. But yeah, um, absolutely. I yep, mean, and I mean, if there's more questions for you guys or anything, it's not like I got a whole lot going on. Just sometimes, you know, if I do, I, I get a, some. I've been on some podcasts, you know, what two or three hours. <laughs> right. I swear, my mind starts to get a little bit goofy. Then, hey, so we, know, we try we not to go to that long uh, for the simple <laughs> fact that the other two guys might be, you know. <laughs> having a little too many man sodies to go on for that long. <laughs> we keep them on here for two hours, they might fall out of their chair. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Uh, no, but, uh, yeah, Nate, you got anything else for them while we got them here? Uh, I'm trying to decide if if <laughs> stuff like what we're doing, maybe having a, a couple hundred acres that we have a pretty good amount of control over, mm-hmm. or having thousands of acres that you have absolutely no control over, which yep. one's better? <laughs> <laughs> Right. And, and if, if that's a question, um, I will say that comes to my mind a lot. Like, I think, man, there's there's days when I wish, like, I had total control because you may say, like, uh, you know, you've, once again, similar to last year, you know, a buck did a certain thing last year. You really had them patterned. And say all of a sudden they go through that area and they, they completely log it. You know, there's not a tree left. Mm-hmm. that buck's gone and, and yeah. it doesn't mean he's going to be on the next ridge over he might he might move two three four miles away and right. to where he and he might be more nomadic that year because he just can never get secure so yeah. um but then there's moments it's just like wow this is so nice because i don't have to hunt the same spot every day i right. i never feel like i'm burning areas out and sometimes you just get bored hunting the same mm-hmm. spot so it works both ways, um, but honestly, um, I think I like it this way more. And I'm talking because I have several hundred thousand acres. There's just even it just there's always there's always somewhere you something different or something new. And everything always seems to be more fresh in this kind of mm-hmm. situation. Yep. yep, we hear I hear it a lot uh, when we go out to guys where they're in Arkansas, Oklahoma, you know, even even southeastern Kentucky out on a yep. property there man i wish we were hunting where you at it's, it's got to be easy hunting up there and i go gee what's that say about me when i can't kill a deer every year you know what i mean so yeah there's uh, i don't care if you're hunting fair chase whitetails i don't think there's an easy place anywhere yeah there's nothing it's easy hunting, about it yep, yep nope so i uh i i i have people think that you know being a, being an outfitter they they think unfortunately they come on a hunt they think it's going to be guaranteed right. it's going to be easy and i can tell you that just because you hire an outfitter and this is not just me anywhere in the country you still got to hunt hard and yep. if you're not willing to hunt hard you might as well not pay to go hunting absolutely yep yep that's kind of the same thing where we're at if you're going to put all that money into your property you know uh, you can do yep. that but it's not magic you still got to put in the time and the work and effort you know. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and your mindset is, is a big thing. And I try to get that into my clients' heads. Like being, being a hunter, it's, I don't, it's obviously a sport, but, you know, I look at a lot of other sports. I don't know if there's a sport out there that creates as much 
mental strength and strategy is, is deer hunting especially. So you really have to train your mind. Mm -hmm. um, you have to, you can't get frustrated. You have to learn to be patient. You know, you're battling sometimes freezing cold conditions where we hunt. You, you have, you know, hard to access, you know, you're, it's, it's physically challenging. So I will say that you got to be a tough person to be a good deer hunter. Um, but if you can train your mind, train your mind right, I really think that that's the, the, the biggest part of the battle of yep. having success is just all mental. Yep, it's definitely a mental game. Um, yep. Which surprises you sometimes when you look at some of the guys that kill big deer and, and you know their mental game is not necessarily that strong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know <laughs> right how that place, works. Right place, right time, yep. right? Um, yep, some no. people are just lucky. But, right. oh, well, you know what? I'd rather, honestly, I'd rather have it the hard way because when you do have success and you know that you – gave it all you had and you worked your butt off that's when it really feels good oh it's a lot more rewarding in my mind um, putting in yep, all the work and fact. effort and stuff yeah. and then finally closing the deal yeah 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 thank you right. i hear you uh, i think that's probably a good a place as any uh, to get you off here uh, we appreciate sure. you coming on and yeah man you're welcome back anytime you want thank uh, you i appreciate it as well yeah uh we look forward to covering more of your articles in the future, hopefully. I assume you're still writing a little bit, writing for... Yep, I got one more. in the next issue, North American Whitetail. It's going to be on shed hunting, and I think it's going to be out next week. So Sweet. I think it'll hit hit just right as far as, a, you know, shed hunting's really going to start to be mm -hmm. the thing everyone's doing. So uh, you guys should definitely take a look at it. I think you'll enjoy it. We will. We were actually talking about, you know, one of the next upcoming episodes will probably be about shed hunting. So maybe we'll check that out and use that one for sure. it. Sure. Man, like I said, right. we really appreciate you coming on, and uh, anytime you want to come back, just give me a holler. Thanks a lot for having me, guys. God bless you. Yep, you yep. too. Thanks we'll to see you. you. Yep, bye-bye. So that was Steve Shirk of Shirk's Guide Service, and obviously, like we said, he writes for North American Whitetail Sun. We covered that article by him, and looking forward to that. Got a little sneak preview of what's coming up from him, so that'll be good. Uh, I know we talked about doing some shed hunting conversation, so... That'll be interesting from his perspective, uh, not just the public ground. Uh, even if you don't have public ground, there's a lot of stuff that we'll be able to take from him as far as the big timber stuff uh, and just finding Chedge in general. But I thought it was a lot of good information there. So oh, yeah. you know, for you guys out there that are hunting public ground, um, one of the you know most interesting things I thought was there's a lot of similarities between what we're doing and what he's doing, even though you know he's out there in the mountains in Pennsylvania and we're over here in the plains of uh, you know, Kansas or wherever we're at, depending on the weekend. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but no, uh, being in Southern Illinois, not in our private ground. The same thing still drives a white-tailed deer. Mm -hmm. That's right. Food and cover. Food and cover. And then breeding that one time of year. Yep. You know, uh, I thought it was, you know, cool what he said about not necessarily going in after a buck just because it's on public ground if you want that one specific buck. Because, man, that's similar to what we do. Yep. Uh, yep. That's right. You put in all that time, effort, you know, whatever it is, uh, trying to get him figured out. He's still got to wait till everything's perfect, just like we do, you know, vice mm -hmm. versa. I mean, it uh, uh, it's all got to come together. Um, two potentially completely different strategies. Um, I'm hunting flat land, little brushy patches, you know. Right. Um, he's hunting out there in the mountains, uh, thousands and thousands of acres. Uh, but, yep, things still same thing still drive that buck mm -hmm. uh, and everything's got to line up just right it yeah we face the same challenges oh yeah and it uh it's cool what he said too about he'd rather even rather hunt that you know public ground and that's what he knows yeah. versus what we're doing yeah um you bring him over here he's probably going to have a you know he's going to have a good idea of what we're doing take us out there we'll have a good idea but it's still going to be a totally different world as far as finding the deer yep but again like we said there's so many similarities uh, yeah just to what drives the deer and then what you're looking for um and i you know we talked a little bit before we were kind of going over a client property with a you know some ridges and stuff on it and moving that top third or bottom third where he was talking about out, even out in the mountains those mm -hmm. bucks are wanting to stay up on the top third of that yeah. mountain uh, yeah and I and pressure a lot of times will dictate where they're at yeah and even on public ground or private ground excuse me uh, pressure goes into a lot of what we do. If you got neighbors right on top of you, and you know when gun season rolls around, which we talked about that a lot this year too. Yep. Um, he talks about just being close to access roads and stuff. 
I'd say the further, uh, just my guess, I don't know, the further away you could get from one of them roads, I'd say the better off things probably would be. Because, mm-hmm. um, I mean, uh, if you could go through and look at where all those roads are, that's probably a good place not to hunt real close to, is yep. my uh, guess. Yep. A lot of people are going to be close to those roads because they don't want to get out there away from them. Yeah, that would be me if I was out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's similar. Like I said, uh, it seems like what he's doing is really similar <clears throat> to what they're doing out west, uh, elk hunting or mule deer hunting. Yeah. A lot of the same principles go in, uh, not only with the mountains and stuff, but as far as just the big public ground is getting away from the roads and getting away from the other people. Because like yeah. he said, if you're hunting and you can look to your left and see a guy 100 yards away and look to your right and see a guy 75 yards away, you're probably not going to see any deer. Uh-uh. At least any big deer. Yep. yep. Hope you like those guys that are close to you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because that's all you're going to be seeing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and that was a lot of what he was talking about was similar to when, you know, when you look at going out hunting west and doing your research and stuff, uh, getting to those spots that nobody else wants to go to and work that hard to get to, and then finding them so much stuff you can't see from a map, uh, going yeah. in there putting boots on the ground. That was a thing that I took from what he was talking about, too. Because obviously yep. we'll use maps a lot, preliminary, but like I told him, there's just so much... You know, because who knows when those maps are from. That's true. And then even if they're up to date, like he was talking about, there could be a really good cover uh, spot underneath canopy where you can't see it from the aerial view. Yeah, yeah. And and I still like using maps for stuff. And and to what he was saying, where on public ground you're going to look at a map and a lot of guys are going to key in on the same things on there. Uh, on private ground, we don't necessarily have to worry about that. So we can, I think we can probably use them more to our advantage, even you know, than what he's talking about doing. But there is a lot of stuff you can't see from them. So you know, it's like any other tool in your bag. You can't rely on it too much. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we use. I wanted to ask him, you know, if he used them at all, which ones he used, because there's always the debate about which map system's the best. Oh yeah. But, you know, we use a lot of Onyx and Hunt Stand both. I think they're both really good at least for plotting stuff out and keeping track of where you're at. Um, and I'm going to go out on a limb and say he probably does use them some for that when he's scouting and stuff, marking stuff where he's at. I should have asked him when we had him on here. But um, hopefully a lot of good stuff for you guys on the public ground because, like we said, we don't have a lot of experience with that. I don't know. Have you ever done any public ground hunting? I've messed around over at Sam Dale before. Mm-hmm. Uh, I shouldn't have said that. Uh, we're in Kansas. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, uh, I've messed around over there. Uh, it's only 1,100 acres. Uh, I can't remember how much of that is lake, uh, but the footprint of the whole piece is 1,140 acres, mm-hmm. I think. Um, over there, you couldn't go too far and not find some kind of evidence of where somebody was hunting. Yeah. You know, um, uh, if you went 200, 300 yards um, and you found you didn't see marks on a tree, you know, for a climber, you didn't see reflective thumbtacks stuck in stuff, you know. Mm. Um, <clears throat> very few, very few people were leaving hang-ons or ladder stands over there. Um, never saw any trail cameras or anything. Uh, but there are, I know there's a few guys that really hunt that place, uh, and that's all they got. Yeah. You know, they're there all the time. Yep. Uh, uh, we've seen 140s, 150s, 160s going in there. You know. Yeah. I don't think they're very prevalent. Uh, right. And again. Oh, I'm saying, I'm going to say that probably 900 to 1,000 acres of it is uh, is woods, huntable anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, but still, it's uh, there's not any great big, the way that lake lays, there's not any great big expanses. You can't really you know? get away from things up there. No. Very um, easy. Everything that I thought I saw anytime I was over there, uh, the closer you could get to that lake, the better. Mm-hmm. That also would, you could say, the further away from the road you could get to better. Yeah. And the statement would, both those statements would put you in the same place. Right. You know what I yep. mean? Yep. Uh, so you take off walking from the road, you're going to hit the lake eventually, mm-hmm. no matter where you go, you know. Yeah. So anyway, uh, most people, it seemed like they were stopping 150, 200 yards from the parking lots mm-hmm. and the roads, you know. That was real common. If you get back there, there was some pockets that looked pretty good, you know, and especially uh, we'd be walking around. Man, this looks great right here. And if you'd stop and look, there'd be a tree there just shredded with the climber mm-hmm. mark. You know what I mean? Yeah, Somebody yeah. else thought so too. Yep. Uh, but, yeah, I, uh, I've i never hunted over there. did some fall turkey hunting. We killed a couple over there uh, a couple of years, I think, me and some other guys. Um, a little bit of shed hunting. Mm-hmm. It uh, It's just never... 
uh, I never thought I'd have any better luck there than I did anywhere else, you know? Right. And the thing, I think another thing to take away from that is if you guys don't have private ground to hunt, don't be scared of the public ground because obviously a guy can have success on it. Oh, yeah. Uh, he's killed a deer every year since he was 13. He's 35 or yep. s- close around there, I think he said, which is, you know, that's incredible to yep. me. Uh, hunt, uh, especially hunting public ground. Uh, and I think he said he killed a buck every year. I think, I think that's what so. He said. Yeah, because yeah. when he was 13, he said, I'm not going to go another year without killing a buck, which yeah. is pretty impressive. But take from that that, you know, if you don't have anywhere to hunt on private ground or any permission ground, uh, don't be discouraged and just give it up. Uh, if you look, maybe you lose some permission ground and that's all you had, go check out some public ground. You're going to run into some challenges that you didn't have on private ground, but then again, there'll be some advantages too, because if you can find those spots where those hunters haven't been or that hidden oak flat, uh, the hidden bedding area, if you can get in there, you're likely to have some pretty good success because that's where the bigger deer are going to be. Another thing about it is you might have to set your expectations a little different. Where we're trying to kill four and a half to seven and a half year old deer on a, you know, four and a half to six and a half year old deer, um, maybe three and a half is a mature deer on the public ground you're hunting. Uh, that's all relative. There's parts of the country where two and a half year old deer <clears throat> is a mature deer. Um, so you got to set your expectations right. And man, if you're killing three and a half year old, 130 plus inch deer on public ground, especially around here, there's nothing to be ashamed of in that. You're doing mind. something. You're doing something. Very few people are doing. That's right. Yeah. The the, the way you, that you're having to do it. Yeah. The most guys that we see coming in hunting on public ground around here, I mean, they're killing year and a half, two and a half year old bucks that are scoring 110 inches. Which, like, you know, teach their own. That's cool. I'm totally okay with that. But like I said, if you go in there and you can kill a three and a half year old buck with a decent set of headgear, man, you're doing something right. Um, and like you said, something not a lot of other people are doing. So don't be discouraged. Yeah. You know, if maybe you like you're in that situation where you lost some permission ground or even if someone you were hunting on sold the private ground uh, maybe a family member or something or something got lost in the family uh, go find somewhere get out in the woods and hunt um, hopefully what he was talking about there not being as much pressure year after year is not a sign of guys going out you know not hunting as much but you know statistics show that we are losing more hunters every year which is a shame and we've talked about that on here before i think uh, trying to get people back in the woods um, a lot of guys real secretive, obviously, about their public ground stuff and what's good and what's not. But, man, if you stopped hunting just because you don't have anywhere to go but public, uh, get out there and find it. There's plenty, you know, even like you said, Sam Dale's not necessarily a big piece. <laughs> it's not the only one around, though. Yeah. You know, Rin Lake, 10 Miles, got several different places around here. Yeah. And then all across the country, there's public ground, you know, spaced out. Uh, in certain parts of the country, there's obviously a lot more than others Mm -hmm. but generally there'll be somewhere you can get out and hunt and to me it's just worth it to be out there and oh you you never know you you might run into a good buck or you know if you're in that area where two and a half years old years old is a good buck for that piece of public ground by all means man get out there and shoot them oh yeah um i think the more hunters we can create and have the better off we're going to be you know obviously like he said, it's an advantage and a disadvantage. He doesn't want it to be because there are less hunters out there, but, yeah. you know, it helps him on public ground. It's not much pressure. Yeah. But I think, you know, like he would agree advocating for, you know, the more hunters to be the better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But you got anything else on, you know, what he said or anything like that? I don't think so. What stuck he, uh, out to you? Uh, that he's killing whitetails in mountains. Mm-hmm. Uh, that just. That's different, ain't it? Oh, man. It's a whole different ball game, seems like. Yeah. At least as far you know, we talk about some similarities, but obviously there's some glaring differences too. Yeah. Uh, my cousin's ground, he's got, I don't know, 70, 80 foot heels, mm-hmm. uh, bluffs, you know, uh, just in, and that's a, in this part of the world, that's an isolated thing. Right. Uh, from everything I've seen, there's just a little bit of that around here. And I feel like I'm sitting on top of a mountain when I'm on that bluff. Yeah. You know, yeah. I it mean, does feel like that around here. Oh, man. And this guy's talking about, I mean, mountains. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. I should have asked him what a, what elevation he's hunting out there, but, yeah, you know, I'm sure it's way more than what we're at, obviously. Yeah. But, yeah, a physical, whole different physical game, too, I would think. I'd be I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be out. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, like I said, there's a lot of good stuff there in what he said, and maybe we'll try to have him back on sometime later in the year or something if he's willing to do that. Um We'll try to line that up. And we're going to line up some other guests. And we got a lot of other good stuff coming up for you guys. Got work one step closer to opening the store here today. And, you know, we got our first 
sponsor lined up for the podcast, and I don't ever want to get to where we have like five minutes of ad reads before we start the podcast, but it's going to help us make it better for you if we can have a few here and there. So if you guys want to support us, obviously when that comes out, we'll give you the, the ways you can do that through the sponsor. Another way, go to RidgeHunterOutdoors.com. If you find something you like, buy it. That'll help us out here. Um, I'm going to maybe in the next couple weeks put up a promo code that we'll be using on here so you guys can get a little bit of a benefit out of just listening and uh, getting a discount on anything you need. You know, If you're looking at planting food plots this spring, go check out what we got. We got some of our own seed. We got some pretty good prices on other seed that, you know, rather than going to Walmart and buying it there, you guys can support what we're doing. And if you like the podcast, hopefully that's something you want to do. Cause like I said, we'll just keep trying to make it better for you guys. And one thing I want to do this year is get more guests on that way. Everybody doesn't get tired of listening to us every week, Yeah. <laughs> but we got for sure a couple more lined up one, you know, both of them we're pretty excited about. One's a guy we know, We've talked about him on the podcast before. And then another one is a fairly big name in the industry. And he works with some of the biggest names in the industry. And I'll keep that under wraps till we officially set a date for it. But exciting stuff coming up. And one more thing before we go. We are officially in for the Iowa Deer Classic. And we'll be posting about that uh, booth numbers and the dates. I believe it's March 4th through 6th, if I'm remembering right. So you guys, if you want to see us, you guys can come see us up there. We'll probably try to do some sort of a podcast, whether it's from the hotel or whatever, while we're up there uh, for you guys. Maybe we can pick up a guest or two while we're there. Maybe we'll record more than one show, but hope you guys are still enjoying it. And uh, I apologize for it being a day late, but that's just how we had to work it out with the guests. So hopefully if you'll forgive us for that, but we'll be on again next Friday. We'll have another show up for you guys. So thanks for listening and we'll catch you then.